Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Beyond the Hype, the Real Impact of AI on Business Intelligence, sponsored today by Metric Insights. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A section. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to know, Zoom, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you can click those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested through throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Marius Moscovici and Mike Smitherman. Marius is the CEO of Metric Insights and has over 20 years of experience in analytics and data warehousing with roles at Oracle, uh, Integral Results, and Linden Lab. He was co-founder and CEO of Integral Results, a leading BI consultancy that was acquired by Idea Integration. He also formed and led the analytics group at Linden Lab. Mike is the VP of Sales and Marketing at Metric Insights. He has over 15 years of product and marketing experience in the business intelligence industry. Mike helped bring analytic products to market with senior roles at Seagate Software, AIM Technology, Tea Leaf, Xero, and Good Data. And with that, I'll give the floor to Marius and Mike to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Hello, everyone. This is Marius. And thank you so much for joining us today for Beyond the Hype, uh, the real impact of AI on BI. Um, so before we start, actually, I'm going to start with something all unusual, and then uh, I, there's a, already a question in the Q&A, and it, and it actually relates to the start of this. So uh, the, Stephen McDougall asks, how long do you think this trend will continue before people are no longer interested, become disillusioned, and funding runs out? Right, and, and I'm not gonna answer that immediately here, but just to give you a sense, whether you are on that spectrum of the, of the AI um, uh, you know, the range, in other words, if you're somebody who is clearly, a little, rightfully perhaps, a little cynical about the, uh, what's going on with AI and all the hype that's there, or if you're an AI accelerationist, you know, somebody who, who's just watching uh, with bated breath uh, every day to see what uh, new developments there are around AI, um, and I cannot wait for the next item and feel like it was going to, uh, you know, change the world uh, very, very quickly. Whether either either side or somewhere, if you're somewhere in the middle, there's no denying that we that there's just a huge amount of hype out there, right? And um, you know, if you were, if you're familiar with the Gartner cycle, uh, the hype cycle, right? I, I think it's it's hard to argue against the fact that we are certainly at that uh, a peak of inflated expectation stage of the hype cycle. And, and those of you familiar with the Gardner hype cycle know that following that is the, I believe, the trough of disillusionment, right? So, uh, so this purpose of this con of this conversation and the, the presentation here is really to to kind of cut through the noise here a bit and really focus on what is the real impact of AI uh, and and where is it, you know how can you really navigate this in a way that that you're not getting to the trough of disillusionment you know that, nor are you sort of overhyping your expectations but but you are uh, in a in a sober and clear-eyed way uh, approaching um, the impact of AI and BI in a way that you can actually generate value and so that's what we want to focus on in this presentation so with that, um, let's talk about you know BI in general and and AI and what is what's the promise with AI as it relates to BI, and I think really at its core, it's all about this unfulfilled promise that's been around with business intelligence as long as I can remember. You know, since I started in business intelligence, I uh, would about 25 years ago, right? And that's the promise of self-service. Now I can remember when the very first generation of business intelligence tools came out, uh, you know, uh, Brio and business objects and those technologies, and they were they were all they promised to completely revolutionize uh, business intelligence, uh, the way people consume data, and they make every all self service. And so didn't really fulfill those promises. And then, you know, the next generation came along, you know, you've got uh, more modern, more e easier to use technologies with Tableau or Looker or Power BI. And, and again, all the same kind of promises tend to come out all around uh, delivering self-service. 
And, and that's so that's always been the promise. And yet it has just generally fallen short. Right? You, you don't really see lots of organizations where uh, business users are self-serving to a large extent and are just not at needing help from uh, their from their analysts. So, you know, let's look a little bit at why that is and what and, and to do that. Let's look at the journey. You know, what is the journey that the BI user goes through um, as they're trying to uh, understand how to get an answer to that question? Right? And, and I would posit for you in, in this discussion that it's very much akin to climbing a mountain, right? So think of Everest or any other sort of challenging mountain that you might climb. And if you're familiar with the process of doing that, you know that, you know, you don't just charge up the mountain. Instead, you, you have a set of base camps that you try to reach. And as you get to each base camp, that sort of sets the stage for the climb or the ascent to the next base camp. And often there are two or three or four base camps that you have to go to before you ascend to the peak. It's very much the same way when a casual user in your organization tries to answer a question with BI. Right? If you think about what their journey is, uh, it starts off where you know, they have a question, and they need to figure out, well, what information asset, what report or analytic is there out there that might be useful in answering my question? So you're know, finding that right report. And this might seem trivial to a, a BI analyst who is very familiar with what are the most relevant reports, or perhaps somebody who's been in the organization a really long time and knows where the go-to reports are. But if you put yourself in the shoes of somebody who is a casual business user, uh, is new to an organization uh, or new to a particular functional area within an organization, it can be pretty daunting to know like what is the right report, which of these 10 reports that look at customer revenue is the one I would actually go to in order to answer this particular question, you know, on which represent maybe something that was you know, created two years ago and is now obsolete and I shouldn't touch versus the thing that actually has the right information for me. So discovering the right report, I mean, that's really the, the first base camp you've got to reach as a user. Then the next thing, if you've identified the right report, then you've really got to understand, you know, what is this report telling you, right? You know, okay, I'm, I'm, I have a question about our sales and I found a useful sales report. Well, is this measuring sales in a way that I understand it? Is it gross? Is it net? Does it include things through channels? Is it, you know, all the different nuances associated with how something as simple as sales or revenue or churn or anything that you might measure in a business, it's in a large organization, these things can very quickly become complex and nuanced. And you've got to be able to understand, you know, what the data means have that data literacy to be able to interpret the numbers correctly. Otherwise, when you're looking at the information, you can very easily draw the wrong conclusion, even if you're looking at the right report. So second ba base camp you gotta reach, really have a good having good data literacy and understanding on what is the report telling you, what are the key KPIs in, in that report, how are they measured, how are they defined. Then if you're successfully get through that, then you can really step in and do the analysis. You're, you're going to use that report, that, 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 that visualization to, to analyze the data, to dive in, and hopefully through that process, you will then get to answer your question. Right? Now, thinking about this for a moment from your perspective of your business user going through this process, it's easy to realize that if at any step in this journey, if I as a business user, fail to reach the, any one of these base camps or have difficulty, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to turn to a Sherpa, right? I'm gonna look for that Sherpa that's gonna guide me through that process, which is gonna be your analyst, right? So, so the default, the, 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 the fallback plan is I'm picking up the phone or I'm sending an email or Slack or Microsoft Teams message to an analyst and saying, hey, Joe, I'm, I'm trying to answer this question, can you help me? And then you've essentially unraveled the entire uh, you know, uh, if it's a human analyst, you might essentially unraveled the entire, you know, self-service paradigm, right? So the hope, I think the promise around AI is to say, can AI be a stand-in for this analyst as, as part of that journey, right? Can it, can it, you know, maybe not in all cases, but can it in a very significant percentage of cases be that guide to, the, to, to help the user 
get through the necessary base camps in order to ascend the mountain so that they do not need to bring a human being in. So that, that those analysts, those they're very scarce in your organization, that they can spend their time not answering, you know, queries about what is this number and how can I get to this report and what's the what's the right answer to this. But they can do that deep dive analysis around how do I move the needle on the fundamentals of this business. So with that in mind, Let's look at how AI can be that virtual Sherpa at each stage. What's happening today in that regard and, and you know, what works and, and to what extent where the challenges are as well. So let's probably the best place to start is to think about the BI tools themselves. Right? And here I would classify you know, tableaus, power BIs, <laughs> micro strategies, but also thought spots and, and, and tell us and any of these tools that are doing the data analysis. You know, what, how, how are they integrating AI into the experience? And if you look at that, if you look at, you know, the, the tool explain data from Tableau or data stories or uh, Fabric and Copilot from Power BI, or, you know, the, the, if you look at all these different technologies, they really do one of two things. They either provide data storytelling, right? And this is kind of an extension on the old NLP, you know, AI Gen 1 type of capability, where instead of you looking at a chart, you get a narrative that describes what's going on with the data, right? Or, you know, here's the key trend line, here are the key anomalies associated with that, here's what's driving those changes. So you get some kind of a, a verbal narrative to explain what's going on behind the data, right? High level trends and the drivers. So you, that's one area of AI. And then the other area, the other solution space here is that they'll try to say, well, instead of having a dashboard that's already present where I need to go and change a bunch of filters to see values, just ask me the question and the tool will give you a visualization or a set of visualizations that are specifically tailored around the question that you're being, that, that you want to answer. So this is something that ThoughtSpot and to some extent Telius originally innovated, but now is present in you know, a tool like Copilot, right? where you don't you can go in and, and as well as with Tableau, where you can, without a pre-existing set of visualizations, with just the data model, you can ask a question, you can get the visualizations automatically generated for you. And you know, we won't spend a huge amount of time on this. These are to some degree successful, to some degree when you get into nuanced and complex data models, they fall short. Uh, you know, mileage will vary. You've got to really look at your particular use cases and 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 take a look to see to you know how how nuanced is the underlying metadata and how well can you really address the use cases uh, with these solutions. But they, they can work effectively to to help and guide the user through this last stage, this analyzed stage of the process. But of course, that is camp three. Right? That assumes that I, as a user, if I'm going to use these capabilities, I already know which data set I need to go to, which data model or Tableau dashboard, or, or you know, it, where do I need to go in Power BI to be able to find this information. So, And that's no use to me if I cannot get through um, Basecamp 1 and 2, as we talked about a moment ago. So how do I go through to get to those other base camps? Well, the answer to that, that's where a business intelligence portal comes into play. And, you know, that's what Metric Insights provides. So let's talk a little bit about that, about kind of what is a business intelligence portal? How does it get you to camp three? How does it get you to the point where you've got the, you're looking at the right analytic with the right context? And then, uh, you know, we'll give you an example of how that actually works in practice and then talk about how AI enables that part of the journey as well. So if you think about the landscape that you have in place, you've got you know, the, your BI tools on the one hand and the applications that are there and some data where maybe you have KPIs, you've got your data catalog sitting kind of off to the side. And of course there's Active Directory, AD groups, all integrated into your access control system within the enterprise. So a BI catalog takes and connects to all of the tools that you have, all your BI tools and applications, as well as the data that has the high level KPIs that you might want to see together with the BI tools. Then it overlays on top of that connection and brings in through that connection the content that is most meaningful for users. So, you know, you might have uh, in your Tableau Power BI environment, you might have thousands of reports, 
many of which are obsolete, some of them are redundant, but there is a core set of capabilities and reporting, reporting assets there that are incredibly useful. So you bubble those up, you have a, a publishing, a certification, workflow and capability to ensure that that is pushed out so that users are then know, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff and know what is the useful content that they should be able to access. And oftentimes you integrate with your data catalog so that you can bring in things like glossary terms, lineage, your things that will provide context to the information. And remember that, that key thing to understand, you know, what does this dashboard tell me? What, what does this KPI really mean? You know, having that kind of information that, you know, often that, that's stored in your data catalog, you're bringing that in and uniting it with the analytics. And then, of course, you publish that for users to be able to consume, and you you know you want to govern that with your existing AD LDAP system, right? So you have a, you don't want to re have to reproduce any kind of governance. So the same uh, uh, security model that governs access within your existing business intelligence tools is is used to govern access within the catalog as well. Uh, and then it's available to users to search and to find that content, whether that be online through the through a you know desktop on on a web or whether it's through a Slack or Teams application or via email or on their mobile phone, however it is that they want to consume it. So you, so there's a presentation layer. So the catalog is intended to you know uh, uh, together with this BI portal ecosystem to act as those as that first the first two base camps of the journey, right? To help users find the content that they care about. And then to be able to help them understand uh, what does that content mean? What are the right key terms? What are the key glossary terms? What's the lineage? What are the things that give me the, the assurance that I'm looking at the right, right report, that I understand what that report is telling me, and now that I can go do the analysis to answer my question. So let's. I'm going to turn this over to Mike now, and he's going to give you an example of what I just described in practice and talk a little bit about how AI can, can assist in that process. Yeah, thanks, Marius. Hey, everyone. Um, so yeah, let me jump across to uh, to Metric Insights here. Um, let's give you sort of the baseline for what Marius was just talking about. And then, as he just said, I'll, I'll layer on sort of how we're thinking about AI and how, how it can help in this sort of discovery process so that we can sort of get to that third camp that Marius, uh, Marius mentioned. So. Yeah, to start for those that haven't seen it. So, you know, let's show an example of what a what a business intelligence catalog or, or portal uh, might look like. Um, so, what you're seeing here on the screen is um, is an example catalog where we're connected in this environment to what is not uncommon in a lot of organizations, a lot of different sources of BI. Yeah, oftentimes in a big company, that's that's potentially multiple BI platforms. But it's also things like um, spreadsheets and documents. It's things like reporting and operational applications. And so for, for sort of that discovery process to work, whichever portal we're putting in place, we need to make sure that we can connect to every source of BI in the organization to start giving you know, the correct content to, to users. So in this example, you'll see I've got content coming from Tableau, Power BI, Click. Um, I've got some spreadsheets in here down the bottom and some files, but each of these tiles here is basically an asset that we have published into the catalog so that users can uh, can get access to them, knowing that they're sort of the blessed version of a particular report that they should be, uh, should be using. Um, and obviously, as Mario said, this is tied into sort of security and permissions. So, you know, any catalog should only show sort of the content that a user um, should have access to at, at any point in time. Um, if we drill into these tiles in a little bit more detail, because this uh, this becomes critical when we start talking about how AI helps in this process. So if we take something like this sales analysis tile and I click on that, when we publish a bit of content, what we want to do is make sure that we're publishing it with the necessary metadata that gives a user the understanding and the literacy around what this particular report is. So in this case, you know, we've got a sales analysis workbook from Tableau. We're picking up a preview of what that, that Tableau workbook looks like right now. Um, but on the right-hand side, 
we've got a lot of metadata that might help the user understand what this particular report is. So things like glossary terms. So this, this report contains a number of metrics. And if I click on those, um, we can see definitions and calculations around what those metrics actually are, perhaps ownership of those definitions, who's responsible for them. So that glossary that Marius spoke about, we may add that, we may pull that in from our data catalog, wherever it might be being defined. We may be tagging the, the, the dashboard with, with certain tags so that it's easy to find. We may have ownership on the dashboard. These are all just examples, but you know, who do I reach out to if I have questions around this? Obviously descriptions um, and, and any other classification that might help me understand you know, what this report is and how I should be using it. So we may have stuff coming in from our Caliber relation platforms that say it's you know for internal use only, or it contains PII data, or it's related to a particular business unit. But the idea when we publish a particular asset is that we, as a user, we can get the understanding of what this is, what it means. And so if I drill into it, I've got the context to now go and analyze that report. So now I'm in the live Tableau dashboard, I can do my analysis. Um, I found what I'm looking for there and, and understand it. Oftentimes when we publish this content, um, we're not going to get into sort of publishing processes today, but as part of a publishing process, typically content will be certified. So again, a user knows uh, it's a particular report that they can trust, perhaps who's being responsible for that certification and when that report was last certified. So again, we're trying to instill this level of trust into the content. So the user knows that this sales analysis is, is the one that I should be using. Um, another promise that has been made for, for many years is also you know, having the definition of what, what's in this dashboard, but also understanding where the data is coming from that has fed this particular analysis that I'm looking at. So having access to lineage at the point of consumption is important. So in this case, our sales analysis dashboard is being populated with data coming from a snowflake table at the top there. And it's actually being used out in a bunch of email distributions as an example here. So again, we wanna make that available to the user so that they've got some knowledge of, of where the where the data is coming from that is, is you know, defining the analysis that they're looking at. So metadata, certification, lineage, is, is all important in, in, in this process. So we publish our content. Um, we organize it on the left-hand side here in a way that makes sense for your business. So one of the challenges today when we're looking to discover BI in the organization is, you know, A, I've got to go to multiple tools. B, I have to understand the organizational paradigm in, in each of those tools. Is it, you know, searching through sites and projects in Tableau? Is it looking through applications in Click? Is it looking through folders on my SharePoint site to find a particular report? Each has a different organizational paradigm. Well, providing a single sort of navigational structure for your users as well is important so they can browse through the content that they have access to. Then finally, and this will transition us into this discussion around AI in a minute, the, the final thing is we want to give them a way of easily searching through this content. And, and search today in a lot of portals, as it is in, in Metric Insights, is kind of a Google style experience. So if I go and search for something like, you know, I want to see everything related to sales analysis, for example, when I run a search like that, what's happening is it's, uh, yeah, it's doing some analysis in my search term to understand that I'm looking for sales information, but it's going out and crawling through that metadata that we've captured around each of these assets to bring me back a ranked set of results that hopefully will, will deliver me the reports that I'm interested in. And similar to sort of a Google style experience, often, often when I run searches, I'll get potentially pages and pages of results. You know, most organizations have thousands of assets out there that potentially users have access to. But you're kind of relying on the algorithms behind the scene to 
understand what you're looking for and look through that metadata and bubble up to the top the most relevant um, suggestions. So, you know, it looks in the title, the description, the tags for sales, and hopefully bubbles up to the top what I'm interested in. And obviously I can go and start to filter out that information by the, the different fields that we were looking at before. So I could further refine my search, but, you know, relies on me to kind of drill through that content now and um, decide what, what it is that I want to focus on and what I, what I want to look at. So, you know, that was a quick sort of tour through the basics of what a, what a BI catalog might, might be trying to achieve. And, and it's really this search paradigm that we're seeing as an opportunity where AI and these LLMs that are out there can, can have an impact on, on, on this process and really help users get to the content quicker. So let's um let's look at what we're talking about there. I'm just going to tee this up from some slides, and then we'll drill into another example. So yeah, how how does AI enhance that that portal experience, that catalog experience today? Um, well, as I just mentioned, the the search paradigm is is very Googleish today, right? So when I run a search, um, I can expect to get a lot of results. I'm probably going to focus on what's on the first page and see if there's anything in there that, that's going to help me answer my questions. If I don't quickly come across an answer, I'm going to pick up the phone, as, as Marius touched on before, and, and reach out to an analyst. But oftentimes, I will get some useful suggestions from the search if, if I know ultimately there's something out there that I'm, that I'm looking for that will help me answer my questions. So really what search becomes is, is quite a good tool for finding assets that I have that I either know or I have a suspicion exist already. Um, you know, there's that report I looked at a while ago. I can't quite remember what it was called. I can't remember what it where it was, but if I run a search, I'll, I'll typically find it. Um, what search isn't great for is, is really making recommendations and suggestions around what it is I should be using to answer a particular business question that I might have. And that's where some of these AI engines can start to help us. And, and we've developed this concept of a, of a concierge in, in our platform. And obviously, it's analogous to the idea of sort of a hotel concierge. So, you know, the, the idea here is I can, you know, if I'm traveling to a new city or country, I've kind of got two options. I can get online or I can look at guidebooks and figure out where it is I want to go and visit and see and where do I want to eat and what, what sites do I want to go and visit. I, I can do that online and based on what I find, I can set myself an itinerary based on the best knowledge that I have on, on my searches. Or the alternative is I can turn up at the hotel and talk to a concierge who is local to the area, has probably the most up-to-date knowledge of what's going on, and through a back and forth conversation can make me some suggestions and recommendations and probably create a more uh, compelling itinerary for me um, for, for my time there. And we want to bring that concierge type experience to the search that we were, we were just looking at. So, you know, how is this working? And we'll look an example of this. So there's, there's some key points around that concierge experience, right? One is, rather than just kind of running one-time searches against the catalog, we want to have more of a conversational aspect to it. So very often if I'm you know, dealing with the analyst, um, rather than looking for content, I'll pick up the phone, I'll ask a question, we'll go back and forth with some clarifying comments or, um, or statements, and eventually we'll come to a, a recommendation. Well, we want to bring that sort of a back and forth conversation to, to search. You know, obviously, it needs to leverage all the metadata and security that we spoke about before, um, and it needs to be accessible anywhere that I'm working. So, yeah, you know, we looked at search in the in the in the Metric Insights catalog, but if I'm on my phone or I'm working in Slack or Teams, I should be able to run this experience there as well. So let's um let's jump back to the demo here and kind of look at how this how this might materialize this out of the way here so yeah as you'd imagine oops let's go back here as you'd imagine even the uh 
zoom window out the way here. As you'd imagine, the first sort of step here is, is our initial question. And I'm going to look at this for, from sort of two perspectives. One is sort of more of the business user. Um, but you'll also see that um, the, the analysts themselves can benefit from looking through this, through this, uh, engaging with this experience as well. So let's take a very simple example to start with, right? So maybe I'm a business user, I'm new to the organization, um, and I'm on the marketing team, uh, and I want to understand the behavior of our website visitors. So, you know, today, if I went and ran a search for website visitors in, in the old search paradigm, it would probably bring me back a few pages of reports that I would have to drill through and figure out which one is going to show me sort of website visitors and, uh, and which one's going to be useful to me. But what the LLM here is very good at and the concierge is very good at is sort of inferring the intent behind my question so we're getting to the bottom of, of website visitors and behavior and ultimately what that means and make a much more sort of targeted recommendation around all the potential website reports that we have, which one um, might help me the most. So this is by no means sort of all the, all the marketing website reports that we have in the system, but it's making an, an educated sort of suggestion here around what it is I might be might be interested in that, that can help me. So on the left hand side, it's actually made one suggestion here. I've got access obviously to the description and the metadata. On the right hand side, it creates sort of this red trail, as you'll see, of suggestions as we go through this. And I can preview those and drill into the content if it's a report I want to look at. And you know, I can continue the conversation. So what other uh, reports oops, do we have for the website? You know, and as we said, there could be lots of them, right? So, you know, I can I can ultimately get to those if, if, the, if that's something I'm interested in. But the point in this first example is by asking a more sort of targeted question, um, the concierge is very good at sort of making some recommendations rather than just throwing everything at me to uh, and, and hope that I can determine which one it is that I should be using. So if we go back and take another example, um, I mentioned that there's value to the to the analyst as well with with this sort of experience. So we we looked at lineage in the demo before and that sort of tree diagram um, that that showed where data was coming from. Well, rather than doing that on a report by report basis, again, maybe I'm new to the organization, I'm responsible for, for creating marketing com content, and I want to know which reports have been built off of our, off of our data mark, our sales data mark. Um, I can run a question around the lineage there, and the concierge is going to go and, and pull back that information. So it's bringing me back. In this case, all reports related to marketing. It's created my, my bread train over here with my thumbnails and sort of suggested the top reports that are, are based on, on the sales data mark. But I can, I can continue that conversation and, and ask additional questions, as we said before. So I see sort of Andrew here has created a lot of this content. Well, I know Andrew. Um, I'm going to engage with him. What other reports? Um, has Andrew Admin created? You know, I know he's key to the business, so maybe I want to understand what other content is out there that he's created. Maybe I want to know which of oops, which of those are certified. So we mentioned the certification process earlier. So I can uh, I can run a a follow up question there. Apologies for the banging in the background, if, if anyone is hearing that. Um, and I can see which of that selection is certified, and I can see the, the certification levels, or maybe questions around the data itself. So um, do any of these uh, contain PII data, so sensitive data? And you know, ultimately, what I'm trying to do with this conversation is perhaps get to a particular recommendation that um, I was I was interested in, in understanding. So I finally got to this uh, 
quarterly financial report that does contain confidential information that was created by Andrew that's based on our, on our sales data map. So you can see rather than just sort of the run the search and, and get to the bottom of it myself, I can, I can ask this, these questions, I can have this conversation and ultimately get to a recommendation. Um, let me show you one more example here. Um, let's look for some customer churn reports here. So again, I'll, I'll start a new thread here, um, asking uh, the concierge to recommend some customer churn reports. Again, it's going out for the metadata. It's looking at these reports. It's taking into, into account things like um, popularity of reports as well when it, when it makes these recommendations. So, you know, ensuring it's, it's sort of, making suggestions that are probably you know the most relevant to, to what i'm interested in so let's come back with with uh, four four reports here again i can follow up with you know are these certified do they contain any confidential information that that sort of follow-up question but i can also start to um, ask questions around what i can do with this content so perhaps um, um how do i subscribe to one of these reports. So, yeah, I can go beyond sort of searching for the content here. And now I'm asking a question about how I can do something with the content. So, you know, how, I, I want to receive one of these reports in my email. You know, can I do that? How, how do I go about doing that? And, and it's important in this case to sort of point out, you know, the questions I'm asking here these are functional things that exist within our portal today. So I can go out to a report and I can subscribe to it. We can create what we what you're seeing here, the idea of a burst, which is a, a set of content that I want to send to email or SAC or however it might be. Um, it's functional things that can happen in the product today, but they require knowledge by the um, end user in terms of how to do that. So how do I take a set of reports and add them to a burst and set a schedule and define where I want to send it, you know, make sure that the content is updated before I send it. That requires product knowledge to be able to do that. Um, what we want to do is start to bring that into, into this concierge experience so that we can start to direct um, users um, through that process. And the first step is, is sort of exposing some of the help information that you're seeing here. So it gives me a description of around how I can go about creating a, a burst. I can ask follow up questions to this as well. So can I set my own schedule for a burst? So again, I can keep the conversation going and start to learn about how I might do this and it can give me some direction. And so, you know, it's finding content, but it's then taking this to um, um, driving more of a sort of actionable uh, functionality around that content as well. And today we do that by sort of indexing our help documentation or allowing users to, to ask questions around that. But I'm gonna hand it back to Marius now and. He's going to talk a little bit about how we can start to use the, the the concierge to actually carry out some of these actions now. So, throw it back to you, Maris. Thank you, Mike. So yeah, so we we've talked about kind of what's uh, what's possible as far as assisting in the journey today, which is the ability to be able to uh, you know help you discover content and help you ask questions that might tell you how to do things. You're going to just facilitate that process where otherwise you would send an email or send a Slack or you have to go sort of searching for that information and have assistance. So what are the sort of the next steps? Well, um, you can imagine that as you're working through this, if you've got a particular result, you might want to say, hey, I want to receive this content, right? So uh, you might want to say, hey, subscribe me to this content. So up here on the right-hand side, I clicked on the button to do that. And then if that's the case, then it will ask you, uh, the concierge will ask you maybe, do you want to include this report in your weekly reporting digest, which you receive every Friday at 8 a.m.? You know, it sees that you already have a distribution. Uh, you say, well, no, I, I want to, you know, send this report to me through Slack uh, Monday morning at 9 a.m., right? And so if you do that, then it would kind of go in and say, okay, you'll create a new distribution. 
uh, uh, that, that it was going to go out to you, for, you includes this particular report, and it'll come to Slack for you with you every Monday at 9 a.m. So this is something if you know your way around the tool, like uh, any BI portal, you'd be able to configure and set up this action. But perhaps you don't. Perhaps you just come in here for the first time, um, or you don't want to learn how to use the you know complex interface to do it. To be able to ask to have a particular common task like this, hey, sending this report using this mechanism this particular time uh, through an AI assistant, you can see that how that's you know very useful and again makes it possible for somebody to self-service in a way that without this AI would would be un very unlikely to happen. Another example in this action menu here is you might want to say, well, I'm looking at this sales analysis report. And I want to share it with another user. This is an interesting report. Maybe I want someone else to see it. Uh, and so the chatbot would ask, will ask you, well, who do you want to send this, share this with? And what's the message you want to include? And I can say, okay, I'm going to send this to Mike Smith. And I'm going to ask him to check, the, uh, let's ask him to check the sales numbers against the latest forecast. Right. And so uh, doing that, then, you know, again, the concierge should be able to take care of that action for you, uh, email you, uh, email that sales analysis to this user with a message uh, saying, hey, John Frank asked you to check this information. So they have, the user would receive that right in the in the inbox of that information. So again, you know, facilitating something that would otherwise require me to, you know, copy and paste and get the link and create an email, you know, just, just making that much easier to do. Another example this is a very common use case is that you might discover a particular report and say, you know, I find this interesting, but, you know, I really don't want to have to come back and check it all the time. I want to be able to set up an alert so that I can receive uh, notification whenever you know the the data has changed here. I don't you know I don't want to look at this dashboard every day. I want to look at it when the data is changing in some material way. So I might say, hey, set up an alert. In this case, concierge asks you, well, what is the alert condition that you want to set? Uh, and then you can say, well, okay, I'm going to be alerted if sales in Canada drops unexpectedly. Right, that's what I'm looking at for. Uh, and then. The concierge can then go in and set up an alert based on Metric Insights already handles alerts, right? So the final alert for you that says, well, if it falls by less than more than 20% for a 30 day moving average, um, it will be scheduled and it'll come to you via email uh, at, at particular time if the condition is met. So again, I've taken kind of a multi-step process and I've made it a, a simple, activated through conversation without requiring me to understand a lot about the UI and where to go to do this and the various w widgets and controls that are possible. I think uh, just to jump in here, I think the other thing that, um, so obviously what we're talking about here is using the concierge or the LLM, the chatbot, whatever you want to call it, to sort of carry out actions that can already happen in the product today. As Mario said, you just need the knowledge to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this is the same for a lot of products that are thinking of integrating AI. How do we get it to carry out functionality? Um, I think you know, one of the added benefits here is in this example, if you look at this alert, you know, I, we asked it to say, you know, if Canada drops unexpectedly, tell us. It's got the knowledge of the metadata behind that particular report to know that, you know, it's daily information in, in the Tableau workbook, mm -hmm. and therefore it can make a an educated suggestion around what the alert rule might be, right? Rather than just saying, you know, well, if it drops below X, we'll do that, right? Mm -hmm. So it knows it's daily information. It knows um, that it's updated in the morning, and therefore we could send the alert at 9 a.m. because mm -hmm. the data would be updated. All that sort of knowledge around the metadata comes back into the suggestion that it's it's making there, which I could then go and edit. Obviously. Yeah, that's a great point because then a human analyst doing the same thing would be doing that, right? They'd be saying, "Well, when should I send it? What's the right criteria? Let me think about that. Let me look at it, and and you know, it, it, be able to take an AI to do that would be would be very useful." So these are all things that are, you know, they're coming and not in the product today, but we wanted to give you a little bit of a of a of a an idea of how we're planning on extend, you know, how how this idea of extending BI portal capabilities beyond enabling search and discovery for documentation through actions uh re really would would you know can potentially have a fairly transformative experience 
around how users are going to consume this. And it's a very practical way of applying AI uh, to, to make, uh, make a user's life a lot better. Um, and in this case, actually, you can see what Mike is saying. I'm, as a user, I might say, well, let me change this to 30% threshold because I don't want 20% and actually send it to me to my send it to my mobile app. Right. And so that that review and update process would work in that regard. So um, with that, kind of this, you kind of see the the picture of more practical approach of what are we talking about? You know, I think there's AI, a place for AI within the BI experience at each layer uh, within this journey, each step within this journey, the the BI portal is the key layer where AI can help with the journey through the discovery and understanding process, uh, where the user tries to find the right analytic and then figure out how they can interpret that analytic correctly. And then the analysis itself, uh, you know, the BI, a BI tool, the report itself, uh, and the capabilities that those vendors are placing, placing into those tools should increasingly be able to help uh, take care of that part of the journey. So hopefully then AI can help with a lot, answer a lot of questions that would otherwise require human intervention. So I think with that, um, maybe we'll throw it back to you, Shannon. And I see a lot of chat going on. We haven't been able to monitor it and then potentially a few questions. Yeah, thank you both for another great presentation. Always such a joy to have you both here uh, with us. And thanks to our attendees for everything. And just to wanna just give you, uh, just to answer the most commonly asked question, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to everybody by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving in here, how is the metadata on an asset managed populated to metric insights? I, I can take that. So um, for us, it, it really comes from sort of one of three places. Um, so the idea with, with creating metadata is if it's being created somewhere else, then we want to leverage that. So some of that might be coming from um, the, the, the tool itself. So if we connect to Tableau and we publish Tableau workbook, we obviously typically get the name and the description. We might get some tags from Tableau, for example. So anything that we can leverage from the tool itself. Um, alongside, if you have a, a data catalog, for example, um, um, an Alation or a Calibra, there may be some sort of classification or I see a future question here on the lineage, some of that might be coming through your data catalog tool and we, we want to pull that in as part of the publishing process. And then oftentimes there's the third thing is that it's, it's added as part of the publishing process. So it's not stored anywhere. When we go through a publishing workflow in Metric Insights, people are actually responsible for adding that metadata at the time of publishing. So maybe it's ownership, maybe it's uh, um, you know, updating descriptions, attaching documentation to the asset. That can be done at the time of publishing. I guess as a fourth, um, some customers are managing sort of metadata and spreadsheets out there and, and they can be imported as well at the time of publishing. So if it exists, we'll, we'll connect to it. If it doesn't, we'll add it as part of the publishing process. And to add to what Mike said, in the case, you know, so that lineage sometimes exists in those data governance tools. And there was a follow-up question point here made about, hey, is that it assumes the metadata exists and is current and accurate. Um, and so, yes, if you in, in ingest it from the data governance tools, that is the assumption. Um, you don't necessarily need to ingest all of it. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to go all the way down to the, you know, oftentimes for a user using this, they don't necessarily care about every ETL rule that was used to bring it in. They just want to know, is this coming from the data warehouse? Is it coming from this table that I know is certified from the data warehouse? Something of that around that, that level. And that is possible to get uh, from the data governance tool. It's also possible to get from uh, some BI tools. So for example, with Tableau and Power BI, we can reach in directly through the APIs that exist there and get lineage um, uh, uh, directly from there if you don't have that information in a data account. Perfect. Thank you so much. So how are the answers and direction that the concierge gives fact-checked for accuracy? Yeah, and that's a great question because, as we all know by now, part of the hype uh, machine that doesn't cover the fact that these LLMs definitely tend to hallucinate, right? So, um, the from our perspective, the 
the, the first of all, I would say that the problem set that we are attempting to solve on the on the portal side of things um, has, in general, less of an exposure to hallucinations for a number of reasons. One, first of all, you're directing users to content, right? So if you are, you know, uh, ninety nine percent accurate in in connecting people to the right content, you know, that's pretty good. That's a really good usage. People will be happy to say, well, I'm losing a resource that 99 out of 100 times is going to give me the right answer. If you're 99% accurate, on the other hand, with answering data questions, probably not going to get that satisfied. Uh, you're not going to have that same level of satisfaction because you're, you know, that one time out of 100 might be the, the, the somebody in the, in the senior management team asking a question and then using that number to make a strategic decision that has massive impact on the, on the, on the business. So that said, you know, first of all, the, the way that it gets used for content matching is a little bit, um, the impact of a hallucination is significantly lower. Um, as far as what we do, we have a feedback cycle, as you've seen kind of in, 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 for OpenAI and other tools where you're just, you're able to you know, provide feedback so that we do have that loop that comes back and it can continue to improve uh, the model as, as it, and, and the prompting that's there in, in order to increase accuracy over time. Um, and then secondly, it's designed carefully in order to be able to make sure that, you know, the, the, you've got sort of this inference layer where it figures out what is the action that you're trying to perform. And then there are tools performing that action and thereby, um, you, you know, as long as you can determine the user's intent in a reasonable way, you can kind of constrain the action to make sure that, that you're generally giving good answers. So there are a number of techniques behind the scenes to do that. Um, and then you saw when Mike showed you that in many cases where you're asking for specific information, we're giving links to it. So you're you're not going to get a, if you get, you're getting a link to an actual report, you're getting a link to an actual document. So it's very easy for you to verify that in fact, what the, what the LLM has told you is correct. I think as well, um, you know, I think we've taken an approach where we sort of err on the side of caution, right? Mm -hmm. um, ask a follow-up rather than yes. just throwing out recommendations, uh, and guessing sort of thing. So yes. the, the, the concierge will come back with a clarifying question rather than if, 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 if there's doubt in the, uh, so what needs in, to in terms of what needs to be done. And I'm going to kind of skip here. Uh, because you, you started touching on this already. Is the LLM behind concierge, is it out of the box or custom trained? Yeah. So what we we can't today, we're able to you kind of bring your own LLM to the party. This is the way that, that it's working today. So, um, you know, at the first release that we've already, we already have in beta today, it works with uh, OpenAI, with GPT-4. It works either through Azure or through um, uh, directly with OpenAI API. Uh, we are building the capability for you to bring your own LLM. You know, some organizations have a high capability LLM that they've created and deployed behind their firewall. Uh, and and we will be able to connect to that. Uh, and then down the line, later on in the year, there will be uh, capabilities that where we ship with an, with a um, with the capability to do some of these functions without having, let's say, connectivity either to your own LLM or externally. It's going to be, you know, obviously you're not going to get the same level of capability from a, a, using a foundation model versus using something that's that can run us on, on a, uh, locally. But but we're looking to provide some level of capability even in those cases where there isn't any LLM uh, capable but available. Sounds great. So how can I can uh, can I control how far back data lineage goes? In practice, these graphs can be so deep. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think you know when we extract lineage uh, ourselves, that is, you know, when we're looking at doing the extraction, for, let's say Power BI or Tableau APIs, we're really looking to the ta tables and columns that are. Um, you know that that are used in the, the SQL and the processing by by the BI tools to get the to get the data, right? So we're not going all the way to whatever derivative sources are there. And and if you think about the consumption model for most users, that's what they're looking for. Um, they don't really care about all the detail rules that you use. Um, they care about, um, you know, where is this data generally coming from? Is it a trusted source? Uh, you can bring lineage from other sources. And if you do, then, of course, it's up to you. Uh, one of the things that, that this sort of point, uh, this question, not just with lineage, but in general, one of the challenges today with data catalogs is that, you know, organizations will catalog everything in their ecosystem. 
And so therefore there's just so much information in these catalogs and it's so hard to figure out like, what is it, what's the piece of information that you need? So usually you are not bringing everything in the, the rule of, you know, you may be bringing in 10, 20%, you're bringing in the content that's certified. You're not bringing in every piece of metadata for that. You're bringing in just the things that users are going to find useful from a data literacy perspective, right? Without overwhelming them. So it's going to be glossary terms. It's going to be that first tier of lineage. It's going to be, you know, key certification attributes, other custom field information, but it's not going to be, you know, every attribute of every field um, and lineage like three or four or five layers deep because that's just that's just overwhelming uh, from a, uh, to a user. Perfect. And we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to slip in as many questions as I can here. So uh, as a nursing informatics student, I'm interested in exploring the relationship between AI and BI in healthcare. Is there a difference in industry? Um, we have a number of healthcare customers, and I'll, uh, you know, the thing I will say is that you know, healthcare system has some of its unique uh, challenges uh, in in a sense, especially in the hospital area. Um, you know, there are, there are systems that historically have been a little bit more of a the silo, black box systems like Epic, right? And so, um, you know, they're starting to open up, and and we're I think we're very hopeful that these capabilities um, are going to be available. At the same time, also hospitals are very challenged. Uh, via, via the ability to, to you know, data in general, obviously because of HIPAA and, and, and sensitivity around PI information, uh, they're often constrained from being able to use services out in the web. Uh, so these foundation models are very difficult to access. Um, that said, there are uh, lots of organizations that are beginning to invest in you know, some more capable open source models or contracting with organizations to provide a foundation model that sits behind their firewall. So those are, those are all... Um, those all things are coming. So I think there's there's a lot of promise uh, for improving uh, thing, things in that area. You know, we're, I'm not an expert in overall in healthcare. So there are many ways in which there are technologies, there are being companies that are doing things with AI and, and healthcare um, that they are very exciting and interesting. But as far as BI goes, um, I, I think it is promising. I think that there's there are obviously healthcare organizations move a little slower. So there's a, you know, it, the jury's still out as to how quickly uh, they, they can incorporate some of these technologies. Makes sense. So are there best practices related to tuning the concierge LLM based on both upstream sources and catalogs changes as well as BI portal usage behaviors, BI data asset usage metrics, discovery, understanding operational questions? So we are, you know, at least in our solution to date, we have not been we have not been fine tuning any of the LLMs that we're using. We are we are because that allows you to then switch off, so that if you know your organization um, can't use OpenAI, but it, but you have a an ins, a Llama Llama two model that's been implemented behind your firewall with the ability to access things, then you can you can connect to that. So we we we're trying to avoid that, and we've and we've accomplished that through prompt majority of the sort of uh, best practices have been around prompt engineering. Um, we enable you to be able to, to you know, supplement the prompt the prompt that we provide. So there are capabilities so that you can add some of your own rules um, and criteria. And that's another place in which you can look, take a look at, you know, what kind of responses you're getting. And if there are places where the answer is not what you want, uh, it's maybe you want to cl clarify that particular term means something. We can add that. You can add additional metadata. You can add your own FAQs. So the way that we you can think of tuning here is you're you're adding to the corpus of knowledge that we ship with and the metadata that we're extracting from all the different from the bi tools and that you're adding through your publishing process you're adding to that perhaps other metadata that you're ingesting that we're bringing into the system uh you know faq documentation other resources uh other other docs and then making that available through to the llm and then potentially adjusting some of the um uh uh, prompts th th that we ship with in order to optimize the use of that information. So that gives us the flexibility then to work with any, any LLM behind yes, the scenes. Yes, that's right. Any LLM behind the scenes, and of course, uh, the more capable your LLM, the more the more accurate the answers are going to be that you receive, together with the prompt that you do. Very cool stuff. Okay, I'm going to slip one more question in here. Do you support Microsoft SSRS hosted on prem? If so, what versions? Or do you have a list of uh, tools that you support? Yeah, so we do um, metricinsights.com or help.metricinsights.com. Search for data sources, plugins. You'll uh, you'll find that list. 
Yeah. Or reach out to us. Or reach out. Reach out yeah. to us, info at Metric and yeah. and we can get you that yeah. I, I don't have the exact versions off the top of my head. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, but we have a number, yeah. lots of customers doing on-premise SSRS, so that's not an uncommon situation. Perfect. Uh, Oh, Mike and Marias, it's so great to have you back. Thank you so much for another amazing presentation. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Yeah, and just a reminder again to everybody, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording for everybody. Thanks to all of our attendees who have been so engaged in everything we do. We just appreciate it. Until next time, thanks again, guys. Thank you.